Welcome to lecture three, in which we're going to talk about accelerated motion. And specifically in this lecture, we're going to cover the following um, broad topics. We ask what is acceleration, that includes how does it relate to the concepts we've met so far, of the velocity in particular. Um, we're going to look at how acceleration can be read off from a velocity time graph, how it, how it appears on that sort of graph. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail um, in the first place. Um, I briefly tell you, essentially, not to get confused, that um, the confusion between velocity and acceleration, V and A, it, it's a very common thing um, to people who haven't studied physics before. Even though you might think, okay, I know they're different, but um, but confusions happen, so I, I sort of point it out directly. And then we'll spend a bit of time figuring out, well, what is the distance traveled by an object that is not moving at a constant velocity, but that is moving with a certain acceleration. And in the course of that, we'll be doing some, um, some sample problems. So to start us off, I want to consider um, a motion of a car. Could be anything, but let's look at a car. Right, so here's my little car parked right here next to the tree. Um, and then we're going to start up the engine, we're going to put our foot on the gas, and off we go. So I drew here a, a motion diagram where the little dots are, as you can tell from the labels, they're one second apart. So it's zero seconds when you start our timer, the car's right here. After one second, it's here, and I've noticed the sort of front of the car here, that's the point I'm tracking. It's here, two seconds, it's here, then here, then here, then here. After six seconds, it's over here and probably keeps going after that. Now, if you look at those, you can tell right away this is not motion at a constant velocity because every second that passes, the car is moving a greater distance than it did during the previous second, right? So, for example, between two and three seconds, that interval, that distance is greater than what happened between one second and two seconds. So, it's not moving at a constant velocity. The velocity appears to be increasing, right? We can see just because later on it's covering more distance in the same amount of time, during one second. Let's plot this on a position time graph. I now abbreviated my labels, let's call it x and t. Now I defined my coordinate system right here already. Um, so I'm gonna say where the car starts, that's my origin, and the x-axis points to the right. It's just the most convenient choice um, here. And I've, I've imagined, I've, I've drawn my motion diagram and I had my ruler on the ground so I was able to label the, the positions of the car at the different times. So let's plot this. So at zero, time equals zero, right? We are at position zero, essentially by choice. That nicely means I can make this one of my data points. Now after one second here, we had 1.5 meters. Now I'm going to estimate a little bit. There's five. Two point so it should be somewhere like somewhere like here, right? One second, one point five meters. After two seconds, we had four point five meters, so it's almost at five. So we're sort of here. After three seconds, we're already at nine. So nine this is ten. Nine is going to be going to be somewhere here. After four seconds, we're at fifteen. So fifteen is here. Four seconds is here. After five seconds, we're twenty-two point five. So it's halfway in the middle between 20 and 25. Let's go over here. As I said, I'm just doing it, doing it rough so we can get the basic shape. The exact um, values are not as important. And then as for six seconds, last data point, we're 31.5. So 30 is here. So just a little bit above that. So somewhere here. So if you look at this, you can imagine if I take more um, pictures, like halfway in between, I will probably just put them in here. Um, and the shape that our graph has is this sort of upward trending curve. So what's happening is that the uh, we start out with a low velocity. The graph has a fairly low slope. In fact, if I drawn this perfectly, I might have given it zero slope here. And then it gets steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper, and it keeps on getting steeper, which remember means that the um, the car is speeding up, right? because the slope of the position versus time graph is increasing. Now, 
Let's look at this in a bit more detail and figure out well, what is the what's the speed of this thing? What's the velocity? I mean, the velocity is always to the right, so I can use kind of speed and velocity interchangeably because I know that it's moving on in one direction to the right. So I've got the direction part of the velocity covered no matter what. Okay, so I can ask, you know, how fast is it going at one second, two seconds? I don't really know, but, but here's what I can do. I can say, well, during the first second, right? What's its, its average speed during the first second? Well, it's going 1.5 meters in one second. So it's going to be 1.5 meters per second here on average. Right, this is my, my average during the first second. Yes, it might start from rest. So we're going to go a bit faster here, but during the first interval, I'm sort of going to say, okay, 1.5 meters in one second. That's the average during the first second. During the second second, well, it's going to go from 1.5 to 4.5. That's this difference of three. So during the second second, it goes three meters per second. On average, probably a bit slower here, a bit faster here because it's continually speeding up. On average, during the first second, it's 3 meters per second. During the third second, well, from 4.5 to 9, it's a difference of 4.5. It's going to 4.5 meters per second. On average, during the second. Next one, in the, the fourth second, well, it covers 6 meters in the one second. So, on average, it's going about 6.0 meters per second. Next one, 15 to 22.5, that's a difference of 7.5 meters so in this second it's going 7.5 meters per second uh, because it always you know those dots are always exactly one second apart and then the last one and this is nine meters so this difference here is it's about 9.0 meters per second so just having done that you can probably already see a pattern here i'm looking from 1.5 to 3 to 4.5 to 6 we're always going up in steps of 1.5. Of course, by setting this up the way I did initially, I um, I chose that particular type of motion. There's no guarantee that real life has exactly, you know, the constant increases depending what you do to your car, right? Are you, putting, are you putting your foot down on the accelerator or not? Um, but in the particular example we're looking at, let's say those are the values. So let's plot those on a graph. Now, we're going to plot what's called a velocity time graph. Um, and velocity time graph essentially is a graph. It has the time along the, the bottom, along the what you might call the x-axis. So that's confusing terminology because we use x for position. Along the horizontal axis, it has time. And then on the vertical axis, we're going to put velocity. So let's um, let's do that. So here, let's see how... how I can make this and make it like this. This is going to be my time in seconds. And then going up, we're going to have the, the velocity. Um, we know we're going to go up to 9, so I guess I have to make this um, like this. So I'm going to just put V, actually, write out velocity. That's going to be in meters per second. Okay, I might need a bit of a scale here. I'm trying to be somewhat accurate. So I'm going to just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 meters, 1, 2, 3, 9. And then along the bottom, we're going to put 1 second, 2 seconds, 3 seconds, 4 seconds, 5 seconds, 6 seconds, just barely. Of course, you always have a choice of um, how you scale your graph. Right? I could have made this a lot bigger. I could have stretched this axis more. But in the space I had, um, this was the scale that I chose. So let's plot this. Right? If we had a motion at a constant velocity, like we talked about in the last lecture, then I would just put, um, say, the velocity was 5 meters per second. I would just put all the, just 5 meters per second the whole time. 5, 5, 5, 5. Okay, boring. We've talked about that. Here, our velocity keeps changing. So we don't really have a value for um, for the very beginning, right? We don't really know when we're starting at zero. So I guess we could put that on. Now, it's 1.5 meters per second on average during the first 
second. So I don't want to say at one second it's going 1.5 meters per second because that's the average during the first second. So I'm going to say maybe right in the middle after half a second. It's actually it's actually correct for this type of motion. Um, but I'm just sort of hand waving the arguing it so we get the basic idea, right? So during this interval, the average um, speed is 1.5 meters per second. So I'm going to mark this point about halfway in the first interval, right? During this segment here, that's my first interval. Well, 1.5 is going to be here. During the second interval, right here, uh, we'll be we'll be going three meters per second. So I'm going to put this um, put this right here. Then we're going to go um, during the, the third interval. We're going to go 4.5 meters per second on average. So I'm going to put this sort of up here. Then during the next one, we're going um, what is it? Six. Six meters per second an hour, that's right. So we're going to go to six. Doing this one, we are here now, 7.5. So it's going to be maybe somewhere here. And then doing the last one, it's going to be nine. So I'm doing this. Now, if I plotted this perfectly correctly, we should be getting a, I think, a straight line um, that goes, that does this. Now, because of our averaging, we got a little bit of a, you know, sort of, it doesn't, because of our averaging, we did a little bit of hand waving. Um, so actually the way this is drawn, the line might not actually go to zero, which we know it should, but it gets us the right idea. How we could have done this more carefully. So what you notice is because these increases are the same, it's the same amount of increase in speed every second to second, um, this is what makes creates a straight line graph. And this increase in in velocity per second, that's what we mean by, by acceleration. Let's write this down. Acceleration. Acceleration refers to the rate of change of velocity, let me write that down. The rate of change with respect to what? With respect to time. How does velocity change with time? Well, if you've, if you, if you Taking calculus course, then you might say, all right, rate of change of velocity with respect to time, that is the time derivative of the velocity. But we can just leave it like that um, right now. You can also say it's the change in velocity per time taken to make that change. Now, the rate of change of, of something, when you, pay, when you have it on a graph, is the slope, right? So the slope of this graph is what's going to, um, it's going to give me the acceleration. So there's another way to write down what the acceleration is. It is also the, the slope of the velocity time graph, and as such, it can be positive or negative. Right. What is the slope? Well, it, this one, it's going up by 1.5 meters per second every second. So here, in our particular example, the, we have A, the acceleration, A, acceleration, is... Um, the change in velocity per time taken. Now, I could say I'm going to go the whole, you know, six seconds or something, but let me just go from one point to the next. So between any two points, one second passes. So I'm going to try to find the slope here. 
this is 1.5 meters per second height. Right, we got it from the data points. Right now we're going from um, here to here. That's those, are, those are the two points that I picked. And that takes one second. And so my acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Um, this is, you can see, it's like rise over run the slope of the graph. So I get 1.5 meters per second divided by one second, which comes to 1.5 meters per second per second, right? So this unit is, you can think of it like this, meters per second change per second. Right? So we get twice per second, we have the meters per second, that's the, because it's velocity, but it will change per second. Um, and we can write that as a sort of shorthand meters per second squared. It's just how you, what you mathematically you can always keep the units in your math and it should always work out. In fact, it's a good check of your work that the units um, work out in the end and we'll talk about it more down the line as we get to solving problems. So meters per second squared sounds funny. It's not terribly intuitive. Like what does this mean, second squared? What, how do you square a second? But its meaning is really this, meters per second, that's the velocity, velocity per time, right, change in velocity um, per time. Okay, let's just um, look at an, another, another example. The example I'm going to look at is this, a bull rolls on a ramp, hopefully you can visualize that in your head, I'm starting from rest, and with an acceleration of 3.5 meters per second squared, Remember, that means 3.5 meters per second every second. That is, that is its rate of change of velocity. What is its velocity after 4 seconds or 90 seconds or 0.2 seconds? So, this one, we can sort of just like interpret what this means, right? So, let's solve A first. After 4 seconds, well, initially at 0 seconds, it's going 0 meters per second. After one second, it's going three meters per second because every second it increases its velocity by three meters per second. Right? That's what this means. Three meters per second every second. Now, after two seconds, it must be going six meters per second. After three seconds, it must be going nine meters per second. And then after four seconds, what we're trying to figure out, it's going 12 meters per second. Now, that's easy enough when you go up to four, but I don't want to keep going to 190. So let's figure out the pattern. Well, we kind of already know. Um, we're going to use that, that in general. We, we have that the um, velocity is equal to the acceleration. Let me write like this. The, 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 the delta V, that means the change in velocity. Um, that's equal to the acceleration times the time interval. The acceleration ACC, abbreviated um, time interval during which the acceleration has occurred. Right? I'm writing the deltas. Remember, delta means change in. Right? That's how we read those. So the change in velocity is acceleration times time. So here, the change in velocity is 3. The acceleration is 3, so after 1 second it's 1 times 3, 2 times 3, 2 times 3. Here yeah, it's 3 times 3, the last one 4 seconds, 4 times 3, because 3 is our acceleration. Um, I, I use the change in velocity rather than just what is the velocity, because in another situation the ball might have started not at rest, but with some initial velocity, then I would have had to add that. For example, if the ball, someone gave the ball a kick and it started out going 10 meters per second already, well then after one second it would have gone 10 plus 3 or 13 meters per second if it had the same acceleration. Um, so, so now we can solve B. B asked us for 190 seconds. So that means the um, delta V, the change in the velocity, is going to be a times delta t, like we just said, which in this case is 3 meters per second squared. 
times 190 seconds, because that's what the question asked us about. You can tell the units, I divide by second squared, I multiply by second, it leaves me with meters per second, so the units work out, and then 3 times 190 um, comes to 570. Now, of course, it's unlikely you're going to get a ramp that, that, that's that long that your ball um, can roll down it for over three minutes and just keep accelerating. If nothing else in real life, that probably air resistance. But, you know, it's a hypothetical scenario. It's the calculation and the thought here that matters. Finally, we want to figure out what happens after 0.2 seconds. It's kind of right at the beginning. Well, same thing applies. I can't really think of it that way could go in 0.1 second steps maybe uh, but I can just use use this just the same delta V is a times delta T which is 3 meters per second squared times 0 0.2 second which um, unless I'm, I'm mistaken is 0 0.6 meters per second it's after 0.2 seconds the fifth of a second and the ball is going 0.6 meters per second it works just the same if it's a fraction of a second or some other, you know, non-integer uh, integer value. So I hope this makes sense. Don't get confused. Delta V, V, delta V means change in, right? So the change in is this. If I already have some velocity to start with, well, then I have to add the change. If the change is negative, I'd subtract the change. You get to do examples with all those sorts of cases um, down the line and in your homework. Now this is kind of a quick service announcement. Don't get confused um, between velocity and acceleration. We've defined them, they're clearly different. And yet I think it's a very common occurrence that I see that um, those two concepts get sort of muddled up in the heat of the moment. So let's be clear, what is velocity? Velocity is how fast are you going and which way. Right, the velocity part includes direction. I'm going to just ignore that right now. Um, meanwhile, acceleration right, tells us about the change in velocity. How quickly is your velocity changing? So how quickly is your velocity changing and you could be going a hundred thousand meters per second incredibly fast but you could have zero acceleration if you just keep going at a constant 100,000 meters per second so let's actually write that down as an example um, so example you're going examples we're going to have multiple ones going 100,000 meters per second um, constantly. Well, in that case, my velocity would be high. And maybe I'll color code this. My velocity would be high, namely 100,000 meters per second. Right? That's 100 kilometers a second or something like 60 miles per second. Right? huge speed. Um, the acceleration would be zero because it's not changing. The velocity not changing. Um, another example. You go from From zero velocity to one meter per second. So that's that's you know it's a walking, it's gentle walking speed. But you're doing this in let's say um, one millionth of a second. So you change, you go from rest to that really slow, gentle speed in one millionth of a second. So 
what do we have our velocity um here is going to be fairly low right it's low i mean what does low mean walking speed so it starts out at zero and and then goes to one meter per second But what's your acceleration? Well, it can't be that high, right? Because you only change it by one meter per second. Well, you'd be wrong. Let's have a look. The acceleration is your change in velocity per change in time, right? I can write it like this, symbolically. Um, which is, well, the change velocity is small. It's one meter per second. But this happens within a millionth of a second. Zero point zero 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 one seconds. Now, because you go from zero to this very slow speed, but you do it in such a teensy amount of time, that means during that teensy amount of time, you must have had a very high acceleration. If you do the math, this ends up being one million meters per second squared. This is huge. This would definitely kill you. I mean, the forces required to make it happen, we'll talk about it later, uh, would definitely kill you and I mean one example where this is occur maybe if you look at a grasshopper jumping right they don't jump super fast and and they, they jump and you can watch them with your eye and they jump past you like oh it's cute um, and but they might jump at one meter per second maybe two meters per second doesn't matter and but they reach that speed from rest within a tiny fraction of a second probably not a millionth right but a few milliseconds a thousandth of a second so they're going to have a really high acceleration for a teensy amount of time to reach a very gentle gentle speed now of course there are examples of high accelerations and high velocities if you sit in a um, in a spaceship and you turn on your thrusters maybe you've got an acceleration of i don't know 30 meters per second squared and it'll really squish you into your seat and then you keep that acceleration on for a long time and you keep going very, 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 very fast after a while. Right? But don't think just because you're going fast, you have to have a high acceleration, or just because you have a high acceleration, you're going to go with a higher velocity. Right? The high acceleration could just be there for a tiny fraction of a second. So don't confuse um, those, those concepts. Let's move on. So we now want to talk about the distance that an object travels during accelerated motion. So let's go back to the ball example that we talked about a minute ago. Well, the ball is rolling on a ramp with an acceleration of 3 meters per second squared. So what one thing that implies is that after one second, the ball goes 3 meters per second. Like if it starts at rest and after one second, it's going 3 because that's what 3 meters per second every second means right after one second you're going to go three um, meters per second after two seconds you're going to go six and so on but let's just focus on the the first second so if you're going three meters per second after one second well how far have you traveled in that one second in the first second now we talked about a car at the beginning, we are doing some hand wavy stuff with averaging and so on, and actually um, the numbers I gave you there don't actually perfectly work if the car really was supposed to be at rest at the beginning and have a constant acceleration. It would have needed a little bit of, it would have needed to start from a teensy speed already, but you know, it, the, the numbers there allowed us to get a feel for what acceleration is. Um, so how far, now we're asking about the ball, how far have you, well has the ball, excuse me, it's, you're not a ball, are you, um, has the ball has the ball traveled in the first second, right? So you might say, well, it goes three meters per second, so it should have traveled three meters, right? Well, no, because it only goes three meters per second in the very last at the very last 
take part of the second at the very end of the second. At the beginning, it goes zero, and halfway through the first second, it goes 1.5, that's half of three. Right. So, so how can I how can I do this? How can I figure this out? So something you might think about is to say, well, maybe, maybe I look at the first 0 0.1 second. And initially, at the beginning of that second, we are going zero. So then we'd get, um, so here, um, v equals zero because we're just starting. Um, so that means we're going, we're going to travel a distance. Um, my change in the position delta x is equal to zero. Then, the second 0 0.2, 0 0.1 seconds. So we're splitting our, our one second into 10 different chunks. The second, well now, after 0.1 seconds already passed, my velocity is 0 0.3 meters per second, right? Because acceleration is three, so after 0 0.1 second, we will have got, we will have acquired a speed of a tenth of that because a tenth of a second has passed. And so then my delta x will be, well, 0 0.3 meters per second at 0 0.3 meters. Sorry, 0 0.03 meters. I'm really losing it right now. Squishing this in there. 0 0.03. Why is that? My velocity is 0.3, and that's been happening 4.1 seconds. So 0 0.1 times 0 0.3 makes 0.3. 0, 0.3. Then during the third, third tenth of a second, right, I'm going to get my, my velocity is now 0 0.6 meters per second because two, like 0 0.2 has already passed. Sorry, I keep writing this. Um, 0 0.2 has passed, right, those times have passed. So now in, in that time, you acquired a speed that's 0.2 times 3, that's 0.6. That's why we're going, the beginning of the third tenth of a second, we're going 0.6. So then, let's just say, okay, during that 0.1 second is a small time interval, we're going to go 0.6, so therefore, we will travel a distance of 0.1 times 0.6, that's 0 0.06 meters. And we could keep going like that, and actually, that would give us a fairly good approximation of the distance traveled. It's not going to be exact because you're making the assumption here that during the point one of a second, right, say the second tenth of a second, during the time the velocity is just this, but that's not quite true because even during that short time interval of a point one of a second, the velocity keeps increasing further because there's acceleration, right? Now we might make this this approximation even better by splitting our a single second not into ten ten tiny chunks, but maybe into a hundred or a thousand, um, and that is in a sense what we're going to do, but we're going to do this in a bit more of a systematic way. So. I want to figure this out. I'm going to figure out a general rule graphically. That's my goal. Okay. So, general rule for what? General rule for distance traveled during accelerated motion. What is the distance traveled here? Let's not get confused about what our goal is. During our acceleration. So first, I'm going to look at, I'm going to take a step back, I'm going to look at a velocity time graph for constant velocity. So if velocity is constant. Velocity is constant then my graph of velocity against time, and I'm not going to care about values right now, I'm just going to um, plot the basic shape. Well, 
let's say you have some velocity v naught the whole time could be 10 could be 5 i'm just gonna write v subscript naught to mean look this is like your velocity right at the beginning of this time interval um, and then you just you just keep it right it's a flat graph meaning no matter at what time i'm looking one two three four no matter when i'm looking i'm always having the same velocity and maybe i care about this time interval here then my um, what's the distance traveled in this case well, it's constant velocity that's easy distance traveled is going to be or the displacement same thing if you're going along a straight line i'm in one direction distance traveled is going to be v times delta t and v here is my um this v naught right remember distance traveled speed times time essentially so if i go five meters per second for two seconds i would have traveled two times five ten right 10 meters meters in total now graphically speaking if you look at this well you say well look this height here that is v naught this base here is delta t so that corresponds to the to the area um, the area and close let me just write it like this Right, the area between the time axis and the beginning of my time interval, the end of my time interval, and the the graph, in this case is flat straight line, that shows the velocity. Well just because I look at this, I know this is true, and I say, hey, look, this is like base times height. Or in this case height times base. That's funny, right? So we we've seen that the distance traveled is just equal to the area on the graph on the velocity time graph does this generalize well we can't assume it right you have to actually show it so does this generalize the answer is going to be yes and let's let's see how we can make sense of that let's draw a velocity time graph for some other motion for some other motion not constant velocity not constant acceleration either i'm going to draw something complicated here's time here's v let's say at the beginning we're going we go we're going with this velocity but then we're sort of speeding up right the velocity is going up maybe we reach some kind of peak and we're going down and there's a little bit of a wave like this some complicated shape now working out the distance traveled here seems complicated right so maybe you've got values for this is values for the different times um, but it's complicated because there's like like how do i how do i figure out the total distance traveled here so what you might think about doing is you might say all right let's do the trick we just used this approximation where we make um if we split our time interval say say this is where it ends i want to figure out what's the distance traveled in this time interval from here to i don't know 10 seconds whatever it is in this time interval i want to label delta t so what i can do is i'm saying okay i'm going to split up my time interval delta t into tiny chunks Maybe 0.1 second, maybe 0 0.0001 second, depending on the context, um, how long this whole thing takes, and so on. So what I might then do is I say, okay, for this first tiny fraction of a second from here to here, I'm just going to pretend my, let me see if I can use a color for this, I'm going to pretend that my velocity really is just this. Right, it's flat, it's whatever that value is. Then during the next tiny fraction of a second, I'm going to pretend it's essentially the average during this little part here. It's kind of what we did before. During the next one, I'm going to, it's going to start on here, ends up here. There's a tiny little difference. I'm just going to sort of take the average, do it like this. 
So what I'm doing is I'm splitting my time interval into lots of tiny, tiny um, sub-intervals. And during each one, I'm going to make the approximation that the that the um, the velocity doesn't change during this little interval from here to here, from this time to this time. Right, time goes this way, so from 3.12 seconds to 3.13 seconds. During this interval, I assume the velocity doesn't change, and then for the next little time interval, it might be a little bit higher. So I'm approximating the actual motion um, with a sort of stepwise motion of constant velocity, different constant velocity, different constant velocity. That's not exact, but it, you know, it, it's a good approximation of the um, of the motion. Let me label those, maybe like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, um, and so on. So what is the distance traveled in each of those tiny intervals? In each tiny time um, sub interval, right? It's a, it's a part of the overall time interval that we care about. Well, during the first one, it's called this delta x1, during the first one, it's going to be the velocity here. Um, velocity. If we subscript 1, this velocity we have right here, times um, the, the length of, of, the first, of the first one. Um, let me use a different notation here. Because I'm going to make all this time interval with the same size, I'm just going to say they have a size. It's, it's written like this, little delta t. So this curly d is also a delta, the same Greek letter, but the lowercase version of this. So we're going to use it for a smaller interval here, a sub-interval of the overall time interval, um, um, delta t, big delta t. We're going to learn Greek in the course of this, of taking physics. So, and then we have for the second interval, the distance traveled during the second one, or displacement during the second one, it's going to be the speed you have there times, again, the length of this interval that's the same, and so on. But because each of those are constant velocity, we know that the result we just had up here applies, right? So we know that that's equal to area 1, it's equal to area 2, um, and so on, right? Delta x3, whatever that is, well, um, it's going to be equal to area 3 because this during this little chunk we're going at a constant velocity according to our approximation so we we keep going and keep going and keep going so then when we sum those up right, that's the sum of all the delta x i'm just going to put a little bit of i in here meaning all the little one two three i's of all the numbers um, that's just the sum of all the areas, right? This plus this plus this is equal to this plus this plus this, because each one is equal to its partner over here. Um, but the sum of all the areas, the sum of this area plus this area plus this area plus this area, well, that's just the um, total area enclosed. And that was the claim that we were trying to, we were trying to prove. Right, you're trying to show that this idea we found earlier, that the area enclosed by the velocity, by the graph on the velocity time um, graph, that this area between the axis and uh, the actual function um, and the start and end of our time interval, the area enclosed in this it corresponds to the, um, the displacement of the object and now we've proved it because this is the total displacement of the object and we showed this equal total area enclosed the way we did that was by just splitting it up into lots of tiny intervals now yes this is an approximation but we can make that approximation arbitrarily good by making those time intervals arbitrarily tiny right in practice i don't want to add up 
10 trillion time intervals to get from here to here. We have a computer do it, if I can write the code for it. Um, but, but I don't have to, because I just, in principle, I know that no matter how tiny those are, the logic I went through applies. The logic that the first little displacement during this first tiny time interval corresponds to the area of it, same thing for the second, same thing for the third. So when I add the areas, they're going to give me the total area. Adding the displacements, give the total displacement. And so we have this generalized result. It's important um, that the total displacement is the area enclosed on the VT graph. And by enclosed, I mean uh, by the, the edges of the time interval that we care about during which the acceleration occurs, the, the um, time axis and the function itself. And that is what we're going to use to look at a specific case of a situation with constant acceleration. The case for constant acceleration includes, for example, the ball we had that had the acceleration of 3 meters per second per second, the ball rolling down a ramp, or we had a car at the beginning that, except for some funny business right at the start, and it was first starting, it had a constant acceleration of 1.5 meters per second every second. So let's imagine a general scenario where we start the time interval somewhere. I'm going to start it here, not starting it at zero. You know, maybe I push go on my stopwatch here and then some time passed. But now something happens. Now there's acceleration. This is the time interval I'm interested in. From here, whatever time that is, you know, five seconds to, I don't know, eight seconds. I'm going to leave it symbolic so we can get a general result. and not stuck just with some numerical values that we can't, you know, work with down the line. So I imagine my object, this is the graph, right? My object initially has a some initial velocity that I'm going to call V subscript naught. That's just a convention to often um, label your initial values with like a naught subscript. Sometimes you see an I subscript for initial um, or one and a two. So there are different ways of doing it. There's no like, you know, um, there's no rule that tells you what to call it, but it's just convention to often um, label your initial values with a subscript zero. And then there's a certain, over a certain time interval is acceleration, so my velocity goes from here to some different value, in this case a, a higher one, so it's positive acceleration. So how can I figure out what is the distance traveled? So I want distance traveled during this time interval delta t, right, this time interval t. That's what I care about. Now, the full motion might involve other stuff before and after, and I might have to calculate that separately. If it was going to constant velocity here, well, I'd use whatever I know about constant velocities to figure out the, the, um, the distance traveled here. Right now, I just care about this time interval. So what we know is that the distance traveled, or sorry, the, the displacement, I should say, um, is, the, is the area enclosed. So enclosed within this time interval that I care about between the time axis and the velocity graph. So that's this area here, um, like everything in here. Now, to actually work this out, it makes sense to sort of split it up into two. I put this area here and this area here. It's just geometrically, right, it makes sense to, to have to work it out in those two parts. Um, so let's work out what each of those areas is. So the, the rectangle is probably the easier part, right, the rectangle at the bottom. What's it equal to? Well, rectangle base times height delta t times what's the height v naught, the initial um, velocity. Done. 
And if there was no acceleration, if we were starting at that velocity, ending at velocity, well, that would be it. We know that result already, right? We've learned that um, when we were talking about constant velocities. What about the triangle? So the triangle is the extra bit sort of stuck on top, right? That, that came about, this extra area on my graph came about because my velocity isn't staying constant, isn't staying flat, it's increasing. Well, I know a triangle is half times base times height. Okay, well, what is the base and what is the height? Um, the base is just delta t. That's the length of the, the base of my triangle from here to here. That's delta t. So that's the one half times delta t. Now, what's the height? Well, okay, let's give it a label. Um, Maybe maybe we're gonna end up at some at some final velocity up here, but this here is clearly my change in velocity delta v. Right, the change in velocity, remember capital delta the triangle uh, means change in change in velocity for this well this is the difference, right? If we start at four meters per second, I end at six meters per second, well the difference is two. That's the difference from here to here. I could just read that off my graph. Um, delta t times delta v. That's my height, the height of my triangle. All right, let's, um, let's work this a more because one half times delta t times what is delta v? Well, delta v, we know, is the change in velocity. That is the acceleration times the time for the change, right? Because we know that acceleration is the change in velocity per change in time. So we've just rearranged it. We did that calculation earlier to figure out the change in velocity of the ball rolling down a hill after a certain number of seconds. So we're going to use that in here. Uh, which then means I can combine those. There's a delta t here from the base, a delta t here that's part of the height. So we get a delta t squared. Um, now my color coding fails because um, because I want to combine the two the two delta t so it's going to go all red now one half a times delta t squared. Remember delta t is like one thing it's like one symbol. Right? It's it's not delta of t squared, but it's delta t squared. Like you read delta t as as one thing. And so then I get the, the result um, that, the, that the displacement during accelerated motion is just the sum of the two areas, this plus this, accelerate what is say tit motion. is equal to the initial velocity times delta t plus one half a delta t squared and this equation is going to take us um, many places. So in principle we've got all we'll ever need to solve at least 1d um, kinematics problems. So now all that's left is to work some quick examples. Before we do, though, I want to emphasize that this equation also works when the acceleration is negative, for example, or when the initial velocity is negative, or both are negative. Right? So science matter, this is displacement, not distance traveled. Um, and we'll look at examples, but I want to put this up front so you're not confused when you see your first um, negative acceleration or negative velocity. In fact, in one of the two examples we're going to work now, we're going to meet negative acceleration. Here's my first example. Rocket car. I assume that it's a car that's been had a rocket strapped to its back, some kind of thruster like it. Um, rocket car has an acceleration. A is 30 meters per second squared. Right? So it's the acceleration is 30 meters per second, and the quest introduces the symbol A um, as kind of the, the variable to use here. 
Starting from rest, how long does it take to travel 800 meters? Okay. Well, here's what we know. Let's apply what we just figured out. We know that delta x is v naught times time interval plus one half a delta t squared. All right. So we want to travel 800 meters. So we're given this one. What else do we know? Well, we know the acceleration, right? It's just, just given to us directly. This is 30 meters per second. And setting it up like this can be really useful. You want to keep track of what quantities do I, do I know. Um, it, it helps to just sort of label them. So when I come back to it as I'm working a more complicated problem, maybe I can immediately see what's going on, what quantities are given. Now, what else is given is that it, well, what do we want? Oh, well, we want the delta t, right? We want the, how long does it take? That's the time in interval. Right, that's what we want. So, I've got an equation, but there's the unknown delta t, and then there's the unknown initial velocity. Hmm, I can't solve this. Oh, wait. We give another hint in this question. It's stating that we're starting from rest, right? So from rest means my initial velocity is zero because we're starting from rest. All right. So now can we solve this then? Well, if this is zero, this whole thing just drops out and I end up with, let's have a look. We're going to have delta x is equal to zero, right? Plus one half a delta t squared. So I really just want to solve for this. I know those two. Notice I'm working symbolically and only plugging numbers in right at the end. Um, there are reasons for that. We'll talk about those more in the near future, but it's a good habit to get into. It helps you find mistakes if you make them. It gives you certain physical insights. We'll, we'll talk about it in more detail. But right now, let's solve it. So I want to solve for this one. This is zero. So I can just rearrange this to um, one half goes over here. Delta x divided by a is equal to delta t squared. And that implies that delta t is just the square root of this. Two delta x over a. Let's plug in the numbers. I have 2 times um, 800 divided by 30. And I take the square root of that. Oh goodness. What's it going to be? 1600 over 30 um, in my books. That is 1600 divided by by 30. Um, I think that comes to 50. The square root of 53.3 occurring, um, which is by my math about 7.3. Seconds. And that's the answer um, we were asked to asked to find right here. Here's example two. It's the last thing I want to go through in this lecture. Um, a sled gliding smoothly at eight meters per second hits a ten meter long stretch of deep snow, and at the end of which it slowed down to six meters per second. What is the deceleration of the sled while on the deep snow? So you have a picture, the sled comes along, it's going at a constant 8 meters per second. Very nice. Um, it hits the deep snow, it slows down, it still keeps going, it doesn't come to a halt, but it's, it's slower, it's only going 6 meters per second on the, um, on the other side. So let's have a look. So what are the tools we have available to solve this? Well, we know how acceleration relates to velocity and time. We derived an expression for the distance traveled, but it involves time, but we don't know anything about time. Can we put the pieces together? And one thing to know that deceleration is kind of a, a funny word. 
it, it's not really like defined as it were in physics um but here well it's deceleration meaning it's essentially a negative acceleration that's slowing it down right so we know what it means here we're trying to find the acceleration but we expect the acceleration to be a negative value if this is the positive direction as you write this down i'm going to make this the positive direction so that means our acceleration should be negative because my velocity that is positive it's eight in the positive direction now it's six in the positive direction my change in velocity is negative so my acceleration i expect should be negative that's what we mean by deceleration okay so let's see what we have so we have that delta x and the time interval i'm going to care about is from here to here obviously start here end here during this time interval it's going to be v naught times the time spent on the deep snow which i don't know plus one half a delta t squared okay so i want a want this um i know i know some of the quantities i know this one right this one is, is eight meters per second and i know how long the stretch is i know the displacement from the instant the sled gets here to when it gets here 10 meters so those are known but I don't know this one. I don't know how long the sled takes. Right? So we want A. We don't know that. Um, we also don't know time spent. So having an equation with two unknowns in delta t, it looks like I'm stuck. Right? But of course I'm not because this isn't just the only thing I can use. I know how acceleration relates to velocity. Namely, I have that A is the change in velocity per change in time. Now, I don't know delta t, but I know the change in velocity. It goes from 8 to 6. Right? So this one is going to be minus 2 meters per second. Why? Because it's equal to um, the delta v is equal to v final minus v initial, final minus initial, which is 6 meters per second minus 8 meters per second, which is minus 2 meters per second. That's where I got that value from. Okay. So now I've got two equations, right? Which have two unknowns a and delta t i can't solve either one but i can i can combine them in some some smart way so what we could do right now is we could just just eliminate delta t um, and that's what we're going to do i'm going to do it symbolically we could plug in numbers but i'm going to do it symbolically to get a sort of general result here so i want to take this equation here let me do some color this this equation here gives me that delta t is equal to as delta t goes over it's going to be delta v over a right i want to get rid of delta t in here because i don't know what it is and i'm not being asked about it either i just don't really care right so let's um let's take this expression here for delta t and plug it into here means we're going to get that delta x here equal to v naught times delta t by delta t is delta v over a and then plus one half okay a is a is a fine with a but delta t is delta v over a and that gets that gets squared now, for this particular problem, at this point, we could just plug in the values 
solve for um, solve for a. I'm going to take this a little bit a little step further though to develop a sort of general little trick. Um, and it's the following. What we're going to do now is we're going to replace delta v. Well, it's the um, final velocity minus the initial velocity. I wrote v i up here. It's a bit be not being very careful here because here I labeled initial velocity v naught, so I should be putting v naught. Um, so I'm going to put that in here. So I'm going to get that delta x is equal to v naught times v final minus v naught over a plus one half a times so this squaring this thing gives me v final minus v naught squared divided by a a squared but one of the squares cancels out this a there right so we we'll end up with this um, now we can simplify this a little bit more we just go to here i'm going to keep writing this down so i'm going to multiply everything by 2a right so what that means is i'm going to get rid of the half and get rid of the a in the denominator so i'm going to get 2a times delta x equals 2 v naught vf minus 2 v naught squared the 2 comes from having multiplied everything by 2a and then plus so this was the first part Plus, I, I multiply it by 2a, so the half is gone, the over a is gone, I just have this. v final squared minus 2 v naught vf plus v naught squared. Of course, this whole thing here is just multiplying out this, um, this thing in the parentheses that gets squared. I hope you remember how to square something, a sum of terms, right? Okay, that's all very nice. What's nice about this is I can simplified a little bit and I can make this thing here cancels this thing here and I've got a 2 minus 2 v naught plus v naught so I can sort of cancel this with this and I've got a single v naught left so I've got 2a delta x is equal to minus v naught squared plus v final squared. So what we've got now is we've derived a new equation that that relates the initial velocity to final velocity, the acceleration and displacement, and nowhere talks about about time. Right, so this thing here, let's write it out again. Um, so we arrange it a little bit. V final squared minus V initial squared v0 vi doesn't matter is equal to 2a delta x super useful if you don't know about the time and you don't care about the time we're not going to find the time from this there's no t anywhere right because we've eliminated it but this is this is another useful equation now note that this is not something fundamentally new we've just did some, we did some algebra with those two so this is not some new you know fancy equation you need to remember I mean, you can but those two will solve all your problems ever right if you try to solve problems for your homework you get stuck and you do the thing where you go online to um to you know google what equation do i use don't ever dare doing that um but if you do it they're going to peddle all sorts of equations at you for all sorts of specific scenarios that is total nonsense those two will solve all your problems you just have to apply them correctly everything else is like specific cases for free for for this no 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 nonsense none of it those two things understanding what acceleration is and having derived this one thing from the graph for the displacement and accelerated motion that will solve all your problems like anything you come across you don't need anything else this one here is kind of a shortcut we can then use right so it's just just a shortcut if you don't know time and you don't care
And we don't care how long it took. We're not being asked that. Um, all right, let's actually find our answer to our problem with the sled. So we are done. Let's have a look. So initial velocity 8, final velocity 6. So in our case, um, here, so we want to get, we want to get the acceleration. That's the unknown. So it's v final squared minus v initial squared divided by 2 times delta x. So that is going to be 8 um, meters per second squared minus 6 meters per second squared divided by 2 times 10 meters. Oops, went off the screen there. So we can do the math that 64 meters squared per second squared. Notice I carry the units. I do all the math properly with the units. Minus 36 meters squared per second squared divided by 20 meters. Um, this comes to, I think, 28 divided by 20 meters. Um, that makes 1.5. The units are going to be meters because it's meters squared divided by meters and per second squared. That's the right units for acceleration. Fantastic. Everything is worked out. That's my answer. Except, oops, I made a grand mistake. Um, I should have said it the other way around. Hopefully you caught on. You were confused. That's fantastic. That means you were paying attention. This was 36. This was 64. Because it's final minus initial. And the final one is 6. And so that makes this just minus 1.4. I caught a mistake right away because I had initially, remember, right at the beginning, initially, I had said, hey, we expect the acceleration to be negative because it's going from going positive 8 to positive 6. So we need a negative acceleration. All right. Done. We've solved it. Um, so now you have a tool. The rest is just, just practice. Sorry, very long lecture. A lot to cover. Um, now the rest is applying it. I'll see you soon.